разницы во времени, и мы ее разберем. Она набирает оборот. Значит, придется разбираться с ней здесь или в Париже, прежде чем она станет слишком сильной. Говорят, она выпивает. В любой игре она идет в атаку и часто оставляет тылы неприкрытыми. Когда она ошибается, она злится. И может быть опасна. Как все женщины. У нас сирота. Много я переживаю. Она такая же, как мы. Проигрывать это не вариант на ней. Иначе какой была бы ее жизнь. Those two guys, they're number two and three in the world. And those guys? KGB. Make sure Borgoff doesn't run away. Hello and welcome back to an academics over analysis of a Queen's Gambit. Uh, so uh, this is part two of uh, the series that, that I'm covering uh, the Queen's Gambit with. The first video I uh, covered uh, a little bit of chess mechanics and exact and talked about the opening uh, that is the Queen's Gambit. And also in the extended uh, version, I al we also talked about uh, the Sicilian defense. And this is all due uh, to my colleague and friend uh, Thanos Gentimus. Uh, who kindly uh, uh, helped me and walked me through uh, some basics of chess. So, uh, now that we, we know something about chess, uh, we can go ahead and talk about uh, other aspects of the show. Now, what we just saw at the very beginning of the video was a conversation uh, between a bunch of Russians uh, about how they're going to defeat Beth Harmon. And some of the things they were saying is that they would need to beat her either in Mexico City or later uh, when she goes to Paris. Uh, and part of the reason why uh, they were talking about those places and not, say, a place in the United States or even in Russia uh, was that it's very hard to travel between uh, United States and Russia, or the USSR, uh, at the time. And this is because of the Cold War. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk to you about communication through the Iron Curtain, and this involving both chess and uh, scientific communication. Um, but before we start, we should really go over something a little bit more basic than that. And I'll be frank with you, uh, the Cold War uh, lasted from 1947 with the, uh, the Truman Doctrine, uh, and it ended in 1991 with the dissolution of the USSR. I was seven in 1991, and I was way more concerned with the Transformers than I was about any sort of geopolitical struggles between two world superpowers. So what I'm going to present to you here is a little bit of uh, my background research on uh, the Cold War, because I certainly can't give you any personal anecdotes. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to roll back uh, and talk about some uh, tidbits of history uh, that can lead us into a discussion about chess uh, and also uh, scientific communication uh, during this time period. Now, the Cold War could be seen as having started uh, in the 1940s uh, when we were <clears throat> during World War II. Uh, this was a time period uh, when there was intense uh, scientific and engineering collaboration in order to develop what we call now the atom bomb uh, through the Manhattan Project. I, Albert Einstein advised Franklin D. Roosevelt that the Germans were working on an atom bomb and it was quite feasible that Heisenberg and his group could possibly create uh, an atom bomb and that would spell the end of uh, the Allied forces uh, in World War II. This led Franklin D. Roosevelt to appoint Oppenheimer to assemble uh, sort of the greatest team of scientists and engineers that we've ever seen. This group ended up being housed at a combination of a U.S. Army base and research facility called Los Alamos. And this is where uh, nuclear bombs were ultimately uh, assembled and we saw uh, uh, their first test uh, nearby uh, and this was the known as the Trinity Test. The atom bomb project, the Manhattan Project, was supposed to be uh, top secret, but uh, it was sort of an open secret uh, in the scientific community. I, we see an example where uh, Paul Halmos was documenting uh, the interaction between 
I, the mathematical vagabond, the Hungarian Paul Erdős, uh, having a conversation with scientists from Los Alamos, where he casually asked, "How is that atom bomb project going?" I, now, this uh, freaked the uh, scientists out, where they thought that this. Uh, Manhattan Project was top secret and nobody should know about it, and you have this foreigner uh, coming from Hungary asking how their project's going. I, you can imagine this also freaked out the FBI, and after a 200-page dossier assembled, uh, they determined that uh, Paul Erdős was mostly innocent and just really liked mathematics. But not everybody was innocent uh, uh, in their wonderings of the atom bomb project. Uh, you had a lot of Russian spies who were uh, working to leak atom bomb uh, designs and secrets uh, from Los Alamos. Uh, two uh, really famous examples of people who leaked the secrets of the atom bomb are Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Uh, who are, happen to be the first uh, two Americans who were executed for treason. And the only evidence that led to their capture was uh, a confession by uh, Ethel's brother, uh, David Greenglass, who thought uh, everybody already knew that she was a spy. So ultimately, Russia uh, had their own atom bomb project, and uh, by 1947, uh, shortly after World War II, uh, we were in a Cold War conflict uh, with Russia, uh, where basically Russia had atom bombs, the United States had atom bombs, and it was called a Cold War because neither side really wanted to instigate uh, an actual open conflict because that would really uh, mean the end of the world in what we call uh, a mutually assured destruction. And so uh, this led to a lot of spy games uh, conducted by the CIA and the KGB. And each side, rather than having open conflicts and war with each other, uh, engaged in what are called proxy wars uh, or uh, sporting competitions at the Olympics, uh, in chess, and, uh, and in academics. Two of the biggest figures in the Russian uh, communist revolution was uh, Lenin and Stalin. Lenin himself uh, was very much for the cause. Uh, he abhorred uh, any sort of idolization and generally didn't believe that he should be in the limelight, or at least this is my hot take of Lenin. I mean, I don't really know all that much about him. Even still, as one of the leaders of the communist revolution, uh, he became uh, idolized by the Soviet populace and uh, anything that he was interested in, it was generally purported that all Russians should be interested in this. Uh, one, and one example of something that he was interested in uh, is chess. Uh, his interest in chess is actually fairly well documented, uh, partly because of how much people admired him. Now, uh, Lenin's interest in chess uh, spread to the rest of the country, uh, where it was generally it moved from being something uh, purported as a, an as a pastime for the rich, uh, with way too much time on their hands, to something that every Russian should really get into. And this is really interesting because the Communist Revolution was all about getting rid of the bourgeois and the, the wealthy class and, and all of their activities. But because Lenin had such an interest in chess, uh, it spread to the rest of the country. Uh, we see that the USSR uh, established many schools uh, for children uh, to learn chess, uh, where they would get uh, very good players to come in and coach children. Uh, the schools were actually funded by the Soviet government, and it's really no wonder uh, that there was such a Soviet dominance in chess uh, when they were so single-mindedly committed uh, to improving their skills there. Now, Garry Kasparov writes in his book, uh, My Great Predecessors, uh, that during the time period of 1975 to 1985, which is a little bit uh, past where the Queen's Gambit takes place, that the International Chess Federation ended up being uh, dominated uh, by Soviet-led countries or uh, by uh, Soviets themselves. And when you look at the, the list of, say, uh, 14 world champions, uh, this list is also dominated by Russians. and. Uh, the Russian world champion Botvinnik uh, generally believed that the only people who should be in charge of the International Chess Federation should be a world champion. You're the best I've ever played. 
Dolly play Borkov. Now, uh, this uh, cult of personality that led the Russian people to uh, adopt chess as such a, uh, a common pastime also uh, had other impacts. Uh, we see that, um, well, Lenin himself uh, tried to avoid the limelight. Uh, Stalin was quite the opposite. Uh, Stalin encouraged uh, this sort of cult of personality around him, uh, where he let people believe that uh, he was all-powerful, all-knowing, a super genius, and all these other things. And uh, and this sort of fed into his mythos that was fed by uh, the USSR and its propaganda. This had an impact on. Uh, on some scientific developments. Stalin left his politics out of out of his nuclear physics because he knew how important uh, maintaining a strong nuclear arsenal was in the Cold War. Um, but when it came to other aspects of things, things like agriculture, he was not silent. For example, uh, there was a Soviet agronomist, uh, Lysenko, who purported that the experiences of, of creatures and, and plants can be passed down to their offspring. Uh, this stands in contrast to uh, genetics, uh, which was uh, on the rise at the time after uh, Mendelian genetics was rediscovered uh, in the early 20th century, where Lysenko said that this is sort of a mathematical contrivance and, uh, and the world doesn't work uh, via genetics. And so uh, he claimed that he could uh, produce crops that would be able to have a greater yields, and Stalin was happy to feed into Lysenko's narrative, where Lysenko was saying that genetics and, and modern agriculture was elitist, and that there is a better Soviet uh, way of doing things. And because uh, Lysenko received Stalin's endorsement, Lysenko's method became the central method of the Soviet government, and you were not allowed to criticize him. Many Soviet geneticists who spoke out against Lysenko I ended up being executed or imprisoned. And one example of this is Zors Medvedev, who was a Soviet biologist who put forth a hypothesis as to aging in that the aging process is an accumulation of mistranscriptions and errors in DNA replication. Zors Medvedev wrote a number of articles speaking out against how the USSR handled its science. I, one was titled uh, The Cult of Personality and Biological Sciences, where he specifically called out Lysenko's work. I, what we're interested in uh, for the discussion here is another article that Medvedev wrote, uh, and that is International Cooperation of Scientists and International Frontiers. Now there he describes what it takes in order to get a visa to travel from Russia to uh, the United States or any other place uh, to give, say, scientific talks. And this is also, uh, it leads into what we saw with in the show with uh, the KGB flanking uh, chess players who were traveling abroad. In order to apply for a visa to leave the country, uh, Medvedev wrote that, and this comes from uh, a book, uh, Scientific Communication Through the Iron Curtain, but he wrote that uh, in connection with applications for foreign travel, Medvedev outlined the enormously complicated procedure that would be and that a would-be academic traveler was forced to undergo. Uh, this involved the preparation of a so-called exit dossier, consisting of a wide range of documents, from a work history to a medical report, and also included a character reference attesting to the applicant's political maturity and moral stability. As we know, the spread of communism is also the spread of atheism. It's a matter of fact, a Marxist-Leninist fact. The holy word is anathema to the Kremlin and the atheists who sit there. I have no quarrel with that. Good. What we want is a statement to that effect. To the press? Exactly. We had something prepared. There you go. I once compiled the application would then be passed ever upwards through various committees ranging from discipline specific panels to a euphemistically titled exit commission which was formed by kgb officials uh, in principle an application would eventually be sent for approval by the central committee of the communist party before uh, arriving finally at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who would prepare a foreign passport for the applicant and apply on their behalf to the appropriate embassy for a visa. Only a fraction of applicants would make it to this final stage. The process could be halted at any point with no explanation. Uh, and, uh, and then basically what you have is that a scientific literature is littered with complaints from conference organizers and delegates on the failure of Soviet invitees to appear. 
I uh, and so uh, he uh, the writer of this book goes on to describe uh, a very uh, particular uh, example of um, of the Soviets invitees not appearing and uh, and that example was at the International Congress of Mathematics and this was held at Harvard in 1950 uh, and they and the organizers received uh, a cablegram uh, from the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences uh, and uh, here uh, they said that USSR Academy of Sciences appreciates receiving kind invoca invitation for Soviet scientists to take part in International Congress of Mathematicians to be held in Cambridge. Soviet mathematicians being very much occupied with their regular work, unable to attend Congress, hope that impending Congress will be significant event in mathematical science. Wish success in Congress activities. And so this was actually somewhat typical and maybe even expected at the time. Look, I have no intention of saying anything like this. Why not? Because it's fucking nonsense. You're crazy. You are out of your fucking mind. Maybe. Probably. But I did it. And it's too late to undo it. Are the tickets paid for? No. Nothing's paid for. I uh, Medvedev, after writing his articles, uh, ended up being arrested and placed into a psychiatric institution, taken from his home while he was surrounded by his colleagues, and he was arrested on a Friday. And with nobody working on the weekend, uh, he he was held there uh, for several days uh, without any recourse. On Monday, when other scientists uh, tried to get him released, his doctor said that uh, there doesn't seem to be anything psychologically wrong with him. But uh, he does appear to be very nervous, and we will want to keep him under observation. He was held in captivity for several days uh, before ultimately being released. Later on, he went to a visiting position in England, and, uh, and then his Soviet citizenship ended up being revoked. Uh, he became a British national shortly thereafter, and then he didn't get his citizenship back until after the Cold War. Now, another interesting thing about traveling uh, and the visas uh, from the USSR is that they wouldn't always, that sometimes they wouldn't show up, but other times they would actually send uh, people who, uh, other people they thought would be better to give a talk, or uh, they would even send KGB agents disguised as scientists, uh, where it became so common that uh, Western scientists would play a game, spot the KGB agent. Uh, and so this is something that we see uh, analogously in the chess world, where Elizabeth Harmon's friends uh, mentioned that two people flanking uh, the world champions from Russia, uh, the greatest chess players in the world, were actually just KGB agents. Now that we know how difficult it was to travel between the countries, I, it is very significant to, uh, to note uh, that it's time in 1954 uh, when several Soviet chess players came uh, from Russia to the United States. And this is coming from a Bobby Fischer biography and credits my wife for uh, finding this for me. And so uh, the book goes on to say, in the summer of 1954, Bobby had an opportunity to see in action some of the greats he'd been reading about. It turned out that the Soviet team would be playing for the first time on the United States soil. In that era of anti-communist hysteria, when anyone in America who read Karl Marx's Das Kapital uh, or wore a red tie was thought to be a communist, the president of the U.S. Chess Federation, Harold M. Phillips, a lawyer who uh, defended Morton Sobel in the Rosenberg espionage case, confided almost with relish that he expected to be called in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee hear hearings and accused of being a communist simply because he tended the chess invitation to the Russians and, well, that never ended up happening. It's important to stress the difference between Soviet and American chess teams at that time. Soviets were all not just professional players, but grandmasters, de designation given to the highest rated chess masters who have distinguished themselves in international tournaments. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II originally, be uh, originally bestowed the title in 1914. It was being used in 1954 and is still awarded today. And the Soviet players themselves were subsidized by their government and um, and were, in many cases, given uh, dachas to, as retreats where they could study and train. Uh, so uh, that characterizes not only 
the significance of the event of uh, Russians coming over here, but the, the stark contrast between uh, the, the chess communities in the United States uh, and Russia, where in the show uh, we saw that they held the American chess tournament in a high school uh, theater, and in Russia they had entire facilities dedicated just to the chess tournament. So this was a, a deeper dive into uh, that sort of interaction that we see uh, throughout the series of American and Russian chess players. And, and yeah, and I think um, that's a good place to stop. So uh, what I'd like to do next is I, I would like to talk about some more mathematical concepts in chess. And, uh, and this involves uh, concepts of, say, combinatorics and computer programming, like depth for searches. And, um, and I also would like to talk about uh, representation theory. Okay, so uh, why don't we go ahead and take a look right now. <laughs> 